The topic of this panel discussion is never miss um, what is it called? Never, never miss the opportunity of a good crisis. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Okay, all right, that's that's a topic. I, excuse me, I only found out yesterday about uh, my role here, so please be patient. So, um, so okay, so this this uh, basically is about what happened lately with COVID. COVID is considered a crisis, and uh, it does sound like this uh, title could have been called the, Rose, the, uh, the Road to Serfdom, the book that uh, Hayek wrote about the tendency to um, identify situations where people may feel uh, less secure or may feel like um, uh, under threat. And in those situations, there's always uh, some politician who steps up and says, OK, what we got to do is we got to restrict freedoms um, and what tends to happen is once, if the problem is fixed, and once the problem is fixed, the freedoms are never reinstated, or very rarely. Or if they are, they're very slowly reinstated. And COVID is not unique in that perspective. You, know, you have an obesity crisis, and what's the answer to it? Um, make sugar more expensive. You have, um, you know... Uh, uh, a credit crunch, and uh, what's the answer to uh, to, to uh, fewer loans being given by the banks? Incentivize them uh, to give more loans by uh, basically doing exactly the same thing that caused the crisis in the first place, and in doing so, you're also regulating even further the financial sector. Um, so, so it's not unique. COVID is not unique in that perspective. But um, it does seem to happen uh, significantly, a lot more. It, it has happened with COVID. Like the things that we have experienced, I never thought I would experience in my life living in, um, in a Western uh, country. So to discuss this point and to see if there is any solution uh, to, to, to ensure that uh, this doesn't keep perpetuating, this doesn't happen, uh, we have uh, our three panelists. To my left, we have Richard Zundrich, uh, who holds a PhD, PhD from the University of Vienna. He is an independent financial advisor based in Switzerland and specializes in capital markets, wealth management, and succession planning and venture capital. Uh, before founding his company, he worked in international corporate finance for a number of uh, global banks and he is a long-standing board member of the Austrian Economic Center and the Hayek Institute. The Austrian Economic Center is uh, our co-organizer of this event today. He is also, um, no, Hayek was his great uncle. So uh, maybe he can shed some light on what Hayek would have to say about this subject since he wrote a book on it. To my right, I have Vera Kitsanova. Uh, Vera Kitsanova is a market urbanist working with Zaha Hadid Architects while writing a dissertation about private urban development at King's College in London. Her research is focused on bridging the gap between urban planning theory and classical liberal discourse. Vera's experience includes working with Atlas Network, London School of Economics, and multiple free market think tanks. And in 2012, she became the first Russian libertarian to be elected into public office. I have to say, out of all the panelists I've ever spoken to, I admire Vera for her bravery. Um, co she's co-founder of the annual Moscow-based Adam Smith Forum, now the largest free market educational conference in Eastern Europe. And to my far right, again, I have Jaron Druk, Jaron is the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, and he also has authored uh, uh, quite a few books. The most recent ones were In Pursuit of Wealth, um, Free Market Revolution, and Unequal is, sorry, Equal is Unfair, or Unequal is Fair, I guess you could say as well. But <laughs> Equal is Unfair. <laughs> so thank you, uh, thank you for joining me, and we'll start from Richard. Richard? 
Well, thank you very much. Um, by ways of introduction, I am not an academic. I am a practitioner. I spent my life in, in banking and in consulting, and my specialty was and is looking at the different laws in various countries and hopefully figuring out how my clients can become better off by uh, in a legal way of, of course, exploiting the differences in laws between various countries. I became interested in uh, our topics today because when I started out in banking, I was educated at the University of Vienna uh, in the 1970s and early 80s, and you know, it was mentioned before, Austria had a very, very left-leaning government at the time, and basically the University of Vienna was teaching Keynesianism and Austro-Keynesianism, and our Austrian prime minister was saying, you know, I'd rather have a million more in debt than one person out of work more and things like that. And at home, I had all these books standing around written by this guy named Hayek, uh, who was my great uncle, and I started reading some of them and all the other stuff that was there, and it just somehow made so much more sense than what I was taught at, uh, at university. And being as the rest of the family uh, were all uh, either in medicine or in chemistry and biology, and so they were all in the natural sciences. I decided, you know, this is what I have to do because I'm the only one practicing the, the dark arts of economics. So much by way of introduction. Never let a good crisis go to waste. I mean, it's always been mentioned, you know, these things come in waves. This is not the first time. It goes back way longer than that. It was actually institutionalized in ancient Rome, in the Republic. In the Roman Republic, they were usually governed by two people, two consuls, or all of their uh, political offices. There was always two guys around, and they kind of canceled each other out and made sure that the other guy wasn't stealing and so on and so forth except in times of crisis. In times of crisis, the Romans had this smart idea, says, you know, these two people can't agree and all these guys are going to be fighting around and nobody's going to say, go this way. And so they invented the office of the dictator. And this is where our word dictatorship comes from. They appointed somebody. When Rome was threatened from the outside, you know, when, when, in the Punic Wars, you know, when Hannibal was climbing over the Alps with his elephants, you know, they said, you know, we need one guy to tell us what to do, and we'll appoint a dictator. And he will lead the fight and have all these powers, and, you know, we'll forget about the Republic for a while. And af But the key aspect, the very key aspect of this whole office was he was appointed for a limited period of time, and then he had to step down. So, you know, you can be a dictator for three months, for six months, or until the crisis is over, and, you know, you've kicked Hannibal back out of Italy, you're good, and then you have to stop. And today, somehow, the first part becomes accepted, and the second part does not. Now, Hayek came from Austria, where in his early life there were a lot of discussions in, in, in Vienna, but you already had communism next door in Hungary after World War I. And he wrote things about the economic cycles, but everything goes in cycles, not just the economy. This goes up and down, you know. Before World War I, Free trade was at its absolute high point 
of any period before or since. Uh, move free movement of people before World War One. You know nobody cared. You could you could move to another country. You just walked in Ellis Island, said fine, I'm here, and then people started out with a, with protectionism after that. Everybody remembers from the road to serfdom, addressed to the socialists in all parties. You know the warnings about. Uh, centralization and about government planning. But a key warning that Hayek spoke about there is that politicians have a tendency in times of crisis to rule with emergency powers. The road to serfdom came out during World War II. And of course, you, you needed to centralize because you were fighting the bad guys. Very interesting situation there. You know, Hayek moved to London, 1930, and in the meantime was a British citizen, and no longer an Austrian citizen. I have his passport here. It's very interesting because when he taught at the end of his life in Salzburg, he needed a visa and a work permit to work in the country he was born in, speaking of tribalism. But anyway, he was in London, and my grandfather, his brother, was in Vienna. They were on two different sides uh, of the war, uh, limited correspondence, uh, and they had different ideas. But what he was warning against was the machine that was put in place during the war effort to infringe upon free market and free enterprise. You know, somebody was in England was making, uh, I don't know, candlesticks made out of brass. And you know, out of brass, you can make other stuff. You can make bullet casings. So the government decided, you know, you're going to stop making candlesticks. You're going to start making bullet casings because we need them to fight the Germans. Which, by the way, speaking of tribalism, everybody remembers that World War I, the major parties, England, Germany, and Russia, these guys were first cousins, the, the people running those countries. I mean, talk about tribalism. Um, lost my mo moment there. So Hayek warned that these powers that the, company, the country was taking would continue after the war when peace broke out. Remember the Roman dictator? He had to stop. But we kept this. In most countries, after World War II, the wartime economy continued to a certain degree. Uh, there were nationalized companies owned by the government. In the UK, there were government monopolies. Austria nationalized, you know, the whole steel and chemical industry because the Russians uh, were going to take it from private people, you know, just take, a, take the whole factories and take them to Russia. And in order to prevent, prevent that, Austria just nationalized the entire steel industry and the entire uh, petrochemical industry, you'd call it nowadays. The thing is, they never kind of gave it back. That only happened much later. And so we had a very central government run, very Keynesianism, uh, Keynesianistic episode throughout the 1950s, 60s, 70s. I remember when I came to London in the 70s, I grew up internationally, I grew up in America, I graduated from high school in Cairo. Uh, at some point in time in the 70s, we moved to Brussels. And we took the car, we drove over to, to, to London. Why did we come to London? Everything was so cheap. Soros had just ruined the pound, 
And, you know, the currency that we had, had in Europe was just so powerful, we could buy all these cheap pounds and buy all this cool high street stuff that you guys had here. Um, and, you know, the, the, in, the, in the United States at the time, uh, unemployment was 10%. Uh, inflation was I don't know where. Uh, and everybody was practicing these Keynesian ideas. And then a couple of politicians who had read Hayek, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, came to power. And then they reduced a lot of these powers that, that the politicians had absur usurped uh, during the war and in the period thereafter. And then prosperity returned to the UK, to the US, to a lot of the world. And then the Iron Curtain fell, and we all thought we had won. This was the great triumph uh, of the, the free market economy and uh, liberal enlightenment ideas. Guess what? It never stops. It all runs in cycles. And so during the 90s, this all worked great. I mean, I was in banking during the, uh, the 90s. You could do no wrong. I mean, it doesn't matter what stock you bought. Uh, you bought. Everything was, was just going up. And then you had a crash. First, you had the dot-com bubble burst. And people started calling for more regulation of financial markets. And then you had 9-11. We've just had the very unfortunate anniversary of that date. But both of these were crises. And both of them led to governments again calling for more regulations more regulation of the previously deregulated financial industry, and all kinds of targeting of individual freedoms through legislation. The Patriot Act, the so-called Patriot Act, which is still in force today, uh, not only imposes a lot more stringent regulation on people in America, but worldwide. There is much more reporting, there is much more legal spying on all of us since 9-11 and thereafter. And then you had a couple of more financial crises, and then you had a couple of more terror attacks, and then you had a couple of more wars. And now, we are all more and more being watched and our rights are slowly, slowly, slowly being chipped away. When I was most of, most of your age, I would, could walk to, go to the airport, walk to the plane, get on the plane, no security checks, nothing, go to, go to my seat, sit down, light a cigarette, have a beer, fly off. Something that all of which you probably can't even, or the younger ones among you can't even imagine. So every good crisis leads to more centralization, and what we have to work for is that we stop this from, stop all of these measures that COVID has brought from becoming permanent. Because the government always thinks, you know, oh, 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 this was so easy. We could just shut down uh, the global economy for a couple of years. We could just decree that people couldn't go to certain places. We could, because of COVID, I had to fill out, I don't know how many forms online I'm twice vaccinated. I had to get a, I had to get a test uh, 
in Switzerland before I left, and I had to pay for uh, the test that I'm uh, the two-day test when I got here. Even though I'm leaving tomorrow, I mean I'll be leaving before the two days are up. But I had to, you know, <laughs> plump down my my 69 pounds anyway. And then strangely, Iman was talking about uh, about languages. You know the COVID test that I took in Switzerland, the one I had to bring with me? They accept English as a language. They accept what? French. And they accept Spanish. All the wonderful uh, tribal countries that the UK guys like to spend their vacation. They don't accept German. I mean, that's like 100 million Europeans speak German. A lot of them do trade with the thing. Nope. English, French, Spanish, sorry. Plus, all the information that I had to enter into the computer system just to be able to come here today to talk to you, which I'm very glad I did, by the way, <laughs> they would have never gotten before this crisis. And my whole trip to come here cost me or rather, the Institute, almost twice as much as my trip three years ago. Because higher COVID taxes and higher climate change taxes and, uh, and the various tests ha almost doubled the price that I had to pay in order to be able to come here and talk to you. I'm glad I did, but I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. I can hold it if you want. Or no, you can hold no, just, no. Do you hear me? Is that fine? Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. It's good to see, finally, see people face to face. Uh, I used to organize the free market roadshow in Eastern Europe, uh, in particularly in Ukraine. Um, and uh, is, now I'm speaking at one in London. It's great to see that the liberty movement is now global. Uh, we have just had the anniversary, as uh, Richard already mentioned, of a major tragedy. Uh, the 9-11 terrorist attack. And this reminded me of a related story which I think very well illustrates the way many people, and including politicians and the uh, self-proclaimed experts, misunderstand how our cities work. The story goes like this. A week after the 9-11 terrorist attack, two respected urban theorists declared essentially the death of a skyscraper that embodiment of urban density. Now I quote, we are convinced, they wrote, that the age of skyscrapers is at an end. It must now be considered an experimental building typology that has failed. We predict that no new mega towers will be built and existing ones are destined to be dismantled. Sounds specifically ironically while we're sitting in the middle of the city of London. In reality, as we know, this never happened, uh, but now we see history repeating. I'm talking about all these apocalyptic predictions in the media that we should prepare for the great exodus, that the future belongs to the suburbia, and that big cities are dying out. And here's probably my most important message for today. Cities live on. Like 20 years ago, our deeply human desire to stick together prevailed over the fear of terrorism. And it will hopefully sooner rather than later prevail uh, over our fear of COVID. But in the meantime, unfortunately, many urban policies are being guided by this fear and by panic. Consider this, policymakers all across the world declare what they call a war on density. They blame big dense cities for the spread of the virus. Here's an example. Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, wrote on Twitter that the density levels in New York are, quote, destructive, 
and the city needs an immediate plan to reduce density. Well, he's a politician. Coming up with plans is his daily job. But sadly, a lot of uh, professional urbanists echo his fears. And in my opinion, this anti-density and in its core an anti-urban sentiment uh, can be as harmful uh, to our cities as the pandemic itself. I'll explain why. First of all, if we don't succumb to panic and simply look at the data, we'll find no correlation between urban density and transmission risk. The World Bank last year analyzed data from Chinese cities and found no, quite, quite the opposite. Cities with the highest infection rates were in fact those with lower population densities. Johns Hopkins University did a similar job in the US. And again, no correlation between density and infection rates. But they found, also found something even more unexpected. Apparently, higher density is linked to lower death rates from COVID. How is it possible? Well, the truth is, we still don't know everything about the virus, the patterns, how it's, uh, it spreads, for example. But we know a lot about the economy of cities. And one reason why big cities are tackling the pandemic better than smaller ones is that simply they are richer. They have better equipped hospitals, better trained medical professionals, and so on. And this, by the way, is, is the direct consequence of density. It's the immense concentration of talent, of capital, of knowledge in one place that helps cities like London or New York grow richer. And in fact, cities like London uh, see even stronger link between density and economic prosperity. Why? Because it's stronger for the service sector, where it's all about face-to-face -face contact. Any guess how much of the London economy relies on the service sector? The percent, roughly. Hmm? Eight is the whole UK, right? London will be higher. Yes, London will be higher. That's right. 91%. So imagine if Sadiq Khan declares a war on density like his New York colleague. Let's hope it's not happening, because in this war, 91% of us will be losers. And urban density is not to blame for the virus, as I've just explained. And actually, it can even serve as a cure uh, to post-COVID recovery. It's not just the economy that benefits from density. It's, uh, the, same goes, the same is true for another kind of capital, uh, the social capital. And I don't know who first came up with this idea of social distancing, but that clearly was a misnomer. Uh, physical distancing, yes, maybe. But remaining socially close is essential, crucial, if we want to get back to normal sooner rather than later. And one important distinction, when I say density, uh, some of you imagine the city of London, where we are all now, but some probably imagine slums of Mumbai or Rio or, or uh, similar cities. And here's one very important distinction. Density is not the same as overcrowding. We are not, actually, think about it, we're not forced to live in cities. There is enough space on Earth for everyone, for each and every one of us to live uh, like a nomad. But we choose not to. We choose to live close to each other because we enjoy it, because we enjoy the diversity, the uh, great choice of lifestyles, uh, uh, the serendipity of random contacts, all these things that uh, we have in, a big, in big cities. So that's why cities will live on. But that doesn't mean that everything with our cities is great and perfect and rosy. In the long run, yes, uh, we have all the reasons to be optimistic. But in the short run, of course, there's a lot to be fixed. And I'm sure that many of you immediately thought, oh yes, housing. And that's true. Excessive regulations, planning restriction, NIMBYism, not in my backyard, you know. Uh, those are all suffocating our housing market. And we market urbanists uh, have been talking about it for years and years. And last year, 
at some point it felt like we had finally been heard when the UK government announced a big planning reform, the biggest one since, uh, actually since 1947. Uh, and it was about liberalizing uh, the supply, liberalizing construction. But as with everything the government is doing, we should curb our optimism slightly and I'll explain why in a few minutes. What's the key to a successful housing reform uh, for London, but essentially for any city, anywhere? It's to make the rules more flexible. Uh, this will help people to adapt faster, which is especially important in times of crisis. Where do we start then? Well, there are low-hanging fruits out there. For instance, in London is the Green Belt. Not many Londoners actually realize that uh, this cherished green belt is not even green. Uh, more, large parts of it are essentially wasteland with no particular aesthetic or environmental quality. And it covers, just think about that, it's hard to imagine, it covers four times the entire built up area of Greater London. So if we only relax this one particular thing, if we only relax the green belt rules, we'll be able to build millions of new homes in a very short period of time, relatively short. Five million to be precise, as the one Adam Smith Institute uh, report calculated. Another good example would be uh, making easier office to residential conversions. Uh, many of us work from home. Now, many of us got used to it in the last a year and a half. So we don't need as much office space as we used to. And the recent expansion of what's called uh, permitted development rights, uh, which allow commercial building to be more easily converted to residential without planning application, is a step in the right direction. And the moment it's perfect for that. That's just... Th those are just two of the many possible ways of delivering new homes relatively quickly. But let's ask ourselves, why is housing such a big problem in the first place? Well, like any other market, the housing market is guided by supply and demand. That's economic 101. So demand for the new homes have been growing for decades and decades. What about the supply? It must be catching up, but it, it doesn't. Why? Because, as I said, the supply side, the developers are uh, bounded by all those excessive and efficient regulations. And I'll say something you probably don't expect to hear from a libertarian. We need more affordable housing. Yes, you heard it right, affordable housing. But the problem is the current definition of affordable housing is very misleading. It's not affordable if it requires subsidy. It's uh, affordable if uh, it's not affordable for our economy. It's not a, a sustainable solution in an economic sense. So, for example, micro flats can be uh, considered affordable homes. Uh, today, there is a, we have a minimum. Uh, the minimum flat size today that a flat that can be built cannot be smaller than 37 square meters. And uh, an average Londoner has a 33 square meters uh, per person. So uh, it's not working in terms of providing everyone with a big uh, space. And removing this requirement would allow young people to jump, finally jump on a property ladder. And yes, I understand it's not an option for everyone, but more freedom to adapt to uh, changes and address very different needs of very different people. And if the government chooses this strategy, one of fewer regulation and less red, tape, less red tape, then the crisis won't be as deep as it could be. And what are they actually doing? That's a good question. So they announced housing reform, as I said, is definitely a good start. The government uh, has pledged to cut the red tape so we can build uh, 300,000 new homes a year. Sounds amazing, right? Well, there is another side of the coin, as usual. 
when Boris Johnson proclaimed his famous build, 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 he called the program the New Deal for a reason. Like the original New Deal introduced by Roosevelt in the last century, uh, this one is deeply Keynesian in its core. So spending five billion of budget money on infrastructure to stimulate the economy, that's a much more questionable aspect of the reform. And one might eagerly say, yes, in my backyard, but certainly not with my money. And just two days ago, we heard another bad news. Michael Gove, our new housing secretary, decided to put the reform on pause whatsoever. Turns out it's not that popular among his uh, core supporters. But you know what? These are weird times we live in. Apparently, liberalizing planning is more popular in Red Wall constituencies. They are desperate to see the old factories and warehouses demolished and built over. Consider this, how ironic it is. People in the Red Wall want to demolish all the walls. And again, the key is flexibility. If we want the reform to happen, we must ourselves be flexible. Uh, we must be ready for tactical alliances and uh, look beyond uh, partisan debates. We know how to change the rules to uh, make cities richer. Uh, all we need is to come up uh, with uh, politically feasible solutions. And policymakers now are quite open to technocratic uh, solutions. So if we just frame our free market ideas in technocratic ways, that might actually work. And housing is a burning issue, uh, but cities, of course, are not all about housing. The cities are also streets, parks, squares, embankments, uh, Sunday markets, flower shows, uh, outdoor cinemas, all these nice things. Uh, and that's another field, by the way, where we see some changes brewing. Um, we have, many of us have switched at least partially to remote working, so we don't commute that much as we used to. So we don't use that much cars, so probably we don't need as much streets allocated to cars. So we can expect our cities to become more walkable, and that's good news. Walkable cities are healthier, safer, happier, uh, friendlier. This is all clear. But you know what? They're also wealthier, uh, by the way. So many case studies show that improving working infrastructure can increase retail sales uh, on the same street by up to 30%. And we have a vivid example here in London everyone's familiar with, the Oxford Circus. Uh, you know this Tokyo-style pedestrian crossing. When it was created, it led to the, so the turnover in the nearby shops uh, increased by 25%. And of course we understand that all the business will not go online. You cannot go uh, to a restaurant on Amazon. And high streets have been awfully terribly hurt by the lockdowns. The government is now threatening to save the high street with introducing online sales tax and an 800 million subsidy. But there are better ways, and uh, improving walkability may be one of them. Remember last summer, the cool new vibe of the Soho when the streets were uh, given to outdoor dining. And uh, just a couple of months ago, we heard another news that Oxford Street might get pedestrianized by uh, next year. Let's see how it, go how it goes. There are rumors of even more ambitious plans uh, that large parts of central London can become entirely car-free. And uh, what I like about it is that a few years ago, uh, we at Zaharid Architects uh, proposed, uh, presented our Walkable London project, uh, which was uh, very ambitious and a lot of people praised it, uh, but everyone considered it was too ut utopian. But things are changing, and now the London City Hall is endorsing something that, uh, to me, uh, suspiciously resembles uh, our own plan. 
And of course, of course, that's important. These developments might not be implemented in a top-down command and control way. There are many examples all over the world, from New York to Seoul, uh, of wonderful, brilliant public spaces developed uh, by the developed by private sector. And here's the rule of thumb. Uh, never trust the government to solve our problems. Cities will, are changing rapidly, but most changes are not coming from planners. They are bottom-up. Take that trendy uh, discourse of smart cities. Uh, the governments worldwide are uh, meeting and uh, discussing how to make cities smart, and the organizations like the World Bank are allocating huge amounts of money on uh, making cities smart. But in fact, most technologies that makes our cities smarter, like uh, online maps, like uh, ranking applications, like uh, uh, mobility apps, they are all uh, the product of the private sector. They are bottom-up solutions. And architects, by the way, also can play a major role here. Things like microflats uh, were proposed by architects, uh, co-living, modular housing, another uh, potential way to deliver the truly affordable housing. Uh, they are all topic that are they are hot topic discussed in the architecture community. Yes, the pandemic has changed our society dramatically. And once again, it has shown how capable we are to uh, adapt to changes. By we, I mean the individuals, the private sector, the private businesses. And we are adapting fast, but we can only do it uh, within existing legal frames. Uh, and expanding these frames is something we should welcome and we should demand. And planners, as I said, have a choice here. They either can prevent people from adapting to changes and prolong the crisis, or they can give us more space to innovate. But interestingly, some adaptations that we're already seeing at that we are part of do not require permission. Uh, do you realize that in the last year, uh, year and a half, most of us, I think all of them, have been blatantly and routinely violating the rules? I'm not talking about wearing or not wearing masks, uh, but raise your hand those of you who at least partially switched to remote working. Yes. Uh, and, but you know, there is the thing called the use-based zoning, so you cannot just simply convert a home into an office or an office into a home, it's illegal. But all of us have done this overnight, uh, breaking the rule, break, uh, threatening one of the most important pillars of the existing top-down planning system. And a good thing is that uh, people gradually realize that uh, urban development is not a zero-sum game. Yes, they always will be NIMBYs uh, opposing any, any changes to the city landscape, uh, but there is an alternative mo movement called YIMBY, yes, in my backyard, and it's going strong in the UK and beyond. Uh, we need to hear more voices like this. We need to be part of this, uh, part of the solution. To summarize, each time that we have a problem, planners claim that we must re -entirely, entirely redesign our cities and our societies as a whole to directly uh, address the specific problem. So, uh, as Richard uh, mentioned, solving the a uh, temporary problem with a permanent solution, with a solution that will stick when the problem is gone, uh, we, and which will, uh, in many cases, even uh, deepen the problem, deepen the crisis. But the real goal of planning is to deal with unpredictability. So going back to Friedrich von Hayek, uh, he famously formulated uh, what he called the knowledge problem. Uh, that knowledge is uh, dispersed in the society uh, and no central planner, however benevolent, uh, has the capacity to grasp it. And this is exactly why we need freedom, because we don't know the future and no one does. What we know, however, is uh, that the pandemic one day will be over 
But things like freedom, the market, uh, creativity are here with us to stay. Thank you. Great. So there's no question that uh, we're already seeing that COVID is being used as a excuse by governments all over the world to expand their power. And it's not a power they're gonna give away. It's not a power that's going to go away very quickly. As Richard has described, it, it seems to never happen. Every crisis is used by the authorities to expand their power. They give some of it back. You don't have to do a PCR test anymore coming into U U uh, the UK but you do have to do an antigen test. You're still gonna have to do a test submitted to the authorities, and who knows how long that'll last. Right? Will we stop having to fill out those forms once we don't have to do tests, or will they think it's a good idea to keep getting information about all of us on a regular basis when we travel around the world? Are borders going to really be open up someday? Who knows when in the United States? We've seen this pattern um, really from uh, the beginning of, if you will, free markets or, or, or freedom since, uh, since really the, the uh, establishment of, of freedom uh, throughout the West. It's, it's cyclical in a sense, but in another sense it is not. The movement is always steady, consistent towards statism, towards greater role for government. It accelerates post-crisis, then some of the, or during crisis, then some of those freedoms are giving back to us, but not all. And then it cons consistently increases. Once in a while, you get a Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher. It's rare. It's unusual. And some of the liberties are given back, but not many. Maybe under Thatcher more than under Reagan, but Reagan gave a great speech. But did he make America freer in any significant, substantial sense? Not really. If you look at government spending as a, as a proxy for the involvement of government in the economy, government spending grew dramatically under Ronald Reagan. So the state continues to grow. Crises are continue to be used. Right? If we go back, and we can go back in America to the Civil War, where uh, Lincoln, as great of a president as he was, instituted the first income tax in American history, the first draft in American history, massive violations of individual rights. Most of that was, re was retracted after the Civil War. But not many of the institutions that were created, I was just telling somebody, uh, we were talking about banking and regula regulations on banking, and in the United States, every bank in the US is regulated by uh, five to seven different regulatory agencies. Actually, mostly it's seven. If you're publicly traded, it's seven different institutions. And one of these institutions is the, is the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. This is an office that was created during the Civil War. Uh, during the Civil War, the United States government printed money for the first time. Uh, say printed, uh, and somebody had to manage the process of printing the money and distributing the money. There was no central bank. So the Office of the Controller of the Currency was created in order to do that. When the Civil War ended, the United States stopped printing money. Money returned, the printing of money returned to banks, private banks. Did the Office of the Controller of the Currency go away? No. Bureaucratic entities never go away. They morph, they change, but they stick around. And the Office of the Controller of the Currency still exists. Nobody knows exactly why but it's still one of the seven regulatory bodies that regulates pretty much every bank in the United States. If you want me to name them, you can ask them in the Q&A. And this process goes on, uh, you know, you see it in the Civil War, you see it after the uh, financial crisis in 1908 uh, in, uh, in the United States, you got a Federal Reserve and you got an income tax. Um, the World War II, uh, the Great Depression, of course, generated uh, the New Deal, uh, and uh, World War II uh, supposedly proved that industrial planning was possible because so much of the U.S. economy was nationalized. Much of it reprivatized after World War II, but much of that planning 
remain. Many of those officers and regulations and regulators stayed on. And you can go on and on. Just recently, of course, we've got 9-11. 9-11, um, of course, uh, generated massive amount of government spending. The creation of the largest department or the largest restructuring of the American government to create the Homeland Security. Uh, we've got the TSA. We've got the NSA listening to all our calls. We've got the Patriot Act. The NSA is under that. None of that has been taken back, even though you would argue that much of the threat supposedly is gone. They tell us, right, Al-Qaeda was defeated, ISIS was defeated, and yet I still have to take my shoes off at the airport. Remember that one guy who tried to smuggle a bomb in, in his shoe, and because of that, globally, in the entire world, no matter whether you're two years old or 89 years old, you have to take off your shoes at the stupid airport? And that's not going away. Who's, who, what politician's gonna have the guts to, to, to say it's okay not to take off your shoes, right? And, you know, shoes being representative for the whole TSA infrastructure. Um, I'm sure there's some countries where you don't have to take off your shoes, but in America, unless you're TSA pre, you have to take off your shoes. These things are, are, are constant. The financial crisis didn't result in less regulation. Given that it was caused by regulation, you'd think that less regulation would be the solution. No, it resulted in more regulation. A greater role for government, more setting us up for the next financial crisis. Uh, 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 you know, Dodd Frank, more government spending, bigger government. The same thing happened. Uh, same thing happened now with COVID. The response is going to be greater government, more spending, more intervention, more controls. Soon we're going to have to, you know, we might have regulations about housing density in particular cities because, oh my God, we might get a virus. That might be one of the conclusions out of COVID, even though it's based on completely wrong science. But that wouldn't be the first time, right? What do we do about this? It seems endless. Government only grows, and crises accelerate government growth. And we're not done with crises. We've had a lot of crises recently. I don't think it's an accident. I think if anything, we're going to have more crises in the next 10 years than in the past 10 years. What do we do about it? Is the response, well, it's the way the world goes. What can you do? I hope not. The solution has to be found in trying to figure out what the reason for this is. Why is it that this happens? Why is it that government only grows? Why is it that every crisis leads to greater growth, greater intervention, greater violations of our freedom? And there are many philosophical causes, but at the political level, the cause is fundamentally that we don't have a conception of the limitation on government. We don't have a view on the role of government. I mean, if there is a view on the role of government, it is that government can do whatever it can get away with, or whatever it can convince a majority of people that it can get away with. There is no principle to guide, okay, I should intervene here, I shouldn't intervene here. There's no principle to say, okay, it's okay to impose a tax here. It's not okay to impose a tax there. There's no principle to engage in, okay, I should intervene in regulating this sector, but I shouldn't intervene in regulating that sector. It's whatever power dictates. It's whatever the whim of the politician or the whim of the majority of the whim of the tribe or the whim of the political party dictates. There's no theory, there's no principle, there's no limiting factor. There's whatever you can sell to your voters. And of course, in times of crisis, people panic, people get upset, and it's easy to sell them on, I have the solution, whether you do or you don't. What we need is to return to a conception of government as limited, not small, I don't know what size has to do with it, but limited in scope. What we need to reconceive of is what is the role of government? Why do we even have one? What is the purpose? And the idea is again coming out of the enlightenment is the idea that individuals have inalienable rights. We have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, property. And that the role of government is to protect those rights. And that's it. 
And if the role of government is to protect those rights, then there's vast number of things the government does, I'd say anywhere between 80 to 95% of what governments do, depending on which particular government, that don't fall into the category of protecting rights. So instead of thinking about how do I buy votes, how do I, um, how do I appease my constituency, how do I make this problem go away, the standard of government should be, is this an act, does this act of mine, the government, protect rights or violate rights? And if it violates rights, it should never be done. Now for that, you need a strong constitution. For that, you need a complete rethinking of political philosophy. You need a complete rethinking of how we approach government, what we think about government. Why is government even involved in urban planning? What's at any of their business? Whose rights are being protected? Why can't individuals negotiate terms for how to use land? Why are those terms dictated by a bureaucrat, by a politician, by a majority? So what we need to rediscover is the concept of individual rights and a government that is solely that is responsible, its sole responsibility is the protection of those rights. And by definition, that would start limiting what the government does. Instead of growing, we start shrinking. And we could shrink fast. And there's no reason that we have such unlimited, large, you know, interventionist governments around the world. This doesn't have to continue in a cycle. But the only way to stop is to find a limiting principle to government. Luckily, John Locke and the founders of America found it for us. We know what that limiting factor is, and that is the concept of rights. So what we need is a shift in political philosophy. That's why it's not easy. We're not going to get it from the Johnson administration or the Trump administration or the Biden administration or any politician in life today. Our job is to fight for that principle, not to fight for any particular politician. Our job is to fight for limited government, not for a slight swing in a slightly different positive direction, but for a complete shift in the way people think about government and its role and its responsibilities. And only then can we stop this endless use of crises, crises created by government. None of these crises would happen without government. 9-11 was a creation, not as a conspiracy, was a creation by the American government in the sense that they could have stopped it. They could have stopped it. They could have stopped it years earlier by taking Bin Laden seriously if they, run, if they did their responsibilities properly. They could have stopped it if the intelligence agencies did, 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 just did their job, if the FBI actually talked to the CIA. If you read a little bit about 9-11, they had the terrorists weeks and months before targeted but because the FBI and the CIA didn't talk to each other, they slipped through the cracks. Um, it, it was incompetence. And the response to 9-11 was unnecessary. And we can get into what the right response would be in another time. Um, and every, you know, financial crisis wasn't some crisis from above that landed on us. Who knows, you know, me meteorite landed on, we got a crisis. No, it's a man-made crisis. You know, regulations created that crisis. Tax policy created the crisis. E bad economic policy created that crisis. And we double up on the bad economic policy. So we need to stop quibbling about economics, stop quibbling about this policy or that policy, and we need a principle. And we have the principle. The principle is individual rights. Leave us alone. Let us govern our lives. And you know, what we need is a permissionless society, a society where we do, we act, we produce without asking permission from the authorities. Uh, th that's the kind of society that leads to the shrinkage of government uh, and, uh, and the reversal of the trend uh, with which we live. Thank you. Um, before we begin with the questions, Richard would like to speak once more, so Richard. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, this was clear. Something that I wanted to bring out is that, of course, from the previous privatism to date, we have, in all of our countries, varying forms of government. Uh, in the U.S. and also in the U.K., you have a two-party system. Well, okay, there are a couple of other parties, but they're ba basically two parties run it, which is due, among others, due to the electoral process. Um, in Austria and Germany, when we had too many parties, some people don't get in because we have to have a minimum of 5% of the vote in order to get in. And everybody thought, you know, this would stop a small party system. And for many, many years, Austria and Germany were also ruled mostly by two parties. You had a smaller system. However, those two parties that were running things, the conservatives and the socialists, they kind of messed things up. And then you had two things happen, is a radicalization. Uh, you used to have um, more liberal Republicans and you used to have more conservative Democrats. And what happened here in the UK and in the US is they basically switched roles. So all the conservative Democrats moved over and became Republicans and all of the more liberal, in the American sense of the word Republicans, just switched to the Democrats. Now, in continental Europe, that didn't happen so much. Basically, new parties got founded. And so rather than have, you know, bigger parties that became more right or more left, what happened there was that, you know, party, you had parties in Germany that are now to the left of the socialists and to the right of the conservatives. And so in Germany, what will happen is the election coming up in two weeks, which will probably be of interest to some of you, will result in a parliament uh, not of three parties as it was for a very long time, or four parties when the Greens came in for a very long time, or five parties uh, when the ex-communists in East Germany, uh, now calling themselves the left, came in. But in Germany, you're going to have a parliament of nine parties. You're going to have to have a coalition. And that coalition is going to be, no matter what happens, it's going to be very weird. <laughs> you know what's very, what's going to be even weirder? Exactly. I was going to say that. Not as weird as in Israel. I don't know if you know the, the coalition right now that's governing Israel, yeah. how weird that yes, one is. Yes, that one is. That is. Okay, that, that's a dinner that conversation. Wins. That wins. Um, but you know what's even weirder? The German electoral system didn't want let votes to be left over. So you were either voted directly, if somebody voted in his, uh, if some, uh, some candidate was in his county, he was either voted directly, and then he won or lost. But a lot of these people won't get an absolute majority because with you know, seven or eight parties, you don't get an absolute majority in your own county. So you come in over the party list, over the so-called second vote. Okay, I can live with nine parties being in the German parliament. What I can't live with is the German parliament, because of this voting system, being expanded from 500 to over 900 people. Because all of these guys that came in over the party list need a seat in parliament. The parliament is physically not big enough to house all of these. So why are people voting for extremist parties? Why are people voting for more and more parties? Because they're fed up with the political system. What happens in the political system? You double the number of parliamentarians. There are enough useless parliamentarians as it is. You don't, you don't have to. I mean, I would, I would change the voting system totally. I would lower the number of people in parliament for every person that doesn't go to vote. 
if you know only 50% of the people vote, then only fi you only get 50% of the seats in Parliament. Now, how about that? That would be an incentive. Um, now, we have another system which people always claim is not going to work in the rest of the world, which is Switzerland, which is bottom-up. Most of the stuff happens on a village or a canton, which is what Switzerland calls its states, and the central government is usually fairly limited in power, and it's a permanent coalition. No, they vote for low taxes. We have tax competition. I live, we have tax competition between uh, the states. Um, I li happen to live in the canton with the lowest taxes. When I file my taxes, the guy reading my taxes gives me tax advice. And I ask him, you know, what are you doing? He said, you know, don't you want your second car in your company and not privately? I'm going, why are you telling me this? Saying, you know, if I, if I don't give you this advice, you're just going to move to another canton. They have tax competition there. Um, but why am I saying this? You can have a referendum. I think you're familiar with referendums around here. Um, if 100,000 people sign a note, you have a referendum on a subject. So tomorrow, we're going to have a referendum on the COVID laws, the emergency COVID laws, whether they will be allowed to continue or whether they should be stopped immediately. We will also have uh, a referendum proposed by different people on marriage for all people, but they each got 100,000 signatures, and tomorrow, uh, I forgot what the fourth one, there's a fourth one coming up, I forgot about that, it'll come to me, but tomorrow these subjects will be decided, I don't know how it's going to end, the COVID vote is too close to call, uh, the likelihood is higher taxes for, for the uh, upper class is probably going to be turned down, and uh, marriage for all is probably going to be approved. That's the tendency right now, but you know anything can happen. But these kind of ideas, because what happens when one of these referendums is approved, the outcome of that referendum has to be put into law by the government, and it is constitutional law. It becomes a part of the Swiss Constitution. So this kind of a system, I'm just going on to uh, what has been said before. Yes, change the political system. Give people more of a voice on a smaller basis. And limit government. If we don't like what government is doing, you know, hold a referendum. And the idea just might catch on. Ah, okay, that is a very, very good question, and that is something that Hayek would have said. The problem with gridlock, which is what you're referring to, which is what we have in, in, in the States, what, what, yeah, and you can have gridlock with two parties if they just don't like each other, because, you know, in previous times, 90%, 95% of laws would be passed unanimously. People would talk, or with a massive majority, you know, uh, Democrats, Republicans actually used to talk to each other. Um, the problem with gridlock, I used to be a big proponent of, you know, if everybody's in their way, they can't pass new laws, and that's great. The problem is, A, we already have too many laws already, and B, when the government or the parliament does not pass the law, two things happen. One, the bureaucrats use uh, existing laws and interpret them by way of uh, you know, ordinances and so on that don't require parliamentary approval. And the second thing is that happens is everything goes to court. 
And then all, all of a sudden you have justices, the Supreme Court or the, uh, uh, or the uh, various other high, high courts, deciding what should actually be, should be decided by lawmakers or the public. So you don't get any improvement. The only way you get improvement is by cutting it down. And no matter what, uh, whether you, you like Trump or not, the one thing he did do was that presidential decree that every time you bring out a new ordinance, you have to cancel two. That should be worldwide. Every time you bring out a new law, you have to cancel two. How about 10? <laughs> yeah. Two seems a little mild. I mean, we're going to disagree a little bit. I mean, it, it, this idea of referendums becoming constitutional scares the bejesus out of me. Um, I, I, I'm, I think the only solution here, really the only solution here, is a system of government that basically makes politicians with regard to economic issues and civil liberties and, and individual liberties impotent. That is, that makes them powerless that separates their ability to influence it. Majorities should not be able to decide whether lesbians can inseminate or not. I mean, all they need is a guy who agrees and a contract. Why is it any of the majority's business uh, to do that? Or, or a majority shouldn't be able to decide to raise somebody's taxes uh, or, or any of these things. The state and education, it's total separation of state and healthcare, total separation of state and urban planning, Total separation of all the state and our lives. The only job of the state is to protect us. And it's the only way because anything else, yeah, we're going to have a few periods. We'll have a few years where things are going our way. We'll get a few laws passed. We'll get, we'll get a, 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 the right coalition together and they'll shrink government a little bit. It won't last. It'll go in these phases. And the phases always move in one direction. That is, the improvement is always smaller than the decline. So long term, the state only grows. Long term, our rights are only being violated more. Long term, we're in deep, deep crisis, much bigger crisis than anything we're seeing today. Uh, and and it, again, you know, there's a principle of individual rights that applies to the COVID situation. It's not up to the majority to decide, I think, what emergency should be or shouldn't be, what we can and cannot do. Uh, you're from Australia? Yes, yeah. Oh, no, you got the accent at least, not oh, New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there has to be something. There has to be something that constrains government from locking you guys out, right? I mean, Australia is now being locked up for what? Hundred uh, Sydney or well, Melbourne New to escape yeah. Australia. You can't even leave Australia. Australians can't leave Australia. I mean, a free country supposedly. They can't leave Australia. So we've seen that last century. Yes, but not, <laughs> no, we didn't pretend it was free, right? We're pretending Australia is free. Right? Well, Soviet Union built walls. We knew they were uh, they were not free. Now we're pretending these countries are free, and you can't leave Melbourne. I think a five mile radius or something. You can't fly between states unless you have permission. Uh, there's this tracking um, app now in Australia that um, I think it's in South South Australia. Is that right? It's a tracking app that they will ping you randomly. You have 15 minutes to take a photo of yourself and it's got a GPS that tells them exactly where you are. And if you're not where you're supposed to be, the police are sent. Sounds like an abusive relationship, isn't it? And this like, is, you, you, this you, is not if, China. This if is a China. husband or a wife did that, they would be in court, right? You would get a, what's, you, what's what? it called? Yeah, if, like. Everyone should just turn their phone off for one day. Yeah. I, I understand in this country you weren't allowed to go to your country house. Is I, that true? I, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever if you've ever seen the movie Spartacus, but there is a there's a if you've ever seen the movie Spartacus, uh, you know there's the the Romans are asking all the slaves at the end who is Spartacus, right? And and everybody stands up. I am Spartacus. And there's a sense in which if everybody stands up, if everybody locks their phones, if everybody goes to their country house. If everybody walks outside when you're supposed to be indoors, um, they can't stop you. They can't stop you. If one or two people do, they'll arrest you. But if everybody does it, if it's true civil disobedience, they can't stop you. 
And yes, so that's what we should be doing. Yeah, but didn't the Romans crucify all those slaves? What's that? In the movie, the Romans did, but the Romans had endless power and there was a limited number of slaves. Hopefully, our authorities have limited power and we are much more numbered than those slaves. But yes. I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah. So that, the, we I said I wouldn't bet on it. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. But we also pretend. You said we pretend. Yes, we pretend we, we have. We live in a free market economy. Oh, I know. I agree with we you. We pretend we live in all kinds of forms of democracy. We pretend yeah. all of that. It's just, it's a matter of degrees. Right. We have until 7, so uh, let's move to the Q&A, please. So, uh, first of all, I really liked the, the starting point uh, that you made about dictatorship and its uh, historical origins. I mm -hmm. have to mention, I have a friend who's from Belarus, and uh, recently, maybe she's watching actually now, and recently I said to her, how are lockdowns in Belarus? Do you have a lot of lockdowns? She said, no, we're already a dictatorship. We don't need, <laughs> we don't need that. So, so that was a good one. But anyway, I wanted to ask a question to the whole panel. Do you think that the term crisis is poorly defined in that, um, for example, you have two companies uh, failing, let's say Enron and WorldCom, and as a result of that, uh, you had uh, a new law passed, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley um, kind of requirements that, uh, you know, every single company now uh, in the States has to comply with, and it's caused uh, so much uh, burden, and it's still there. Uh, you had, uh, in, in your field of architecture, I guess, or similar, you had the, the Grafnell Tower, you know, the, the, the building that caught fire. Suddenly, all the cladding, all the cladding everywhere has to change. Um, or uh, you had the, the dot-com uh, bubble that you mentioned, and then, you know, okay, certain industry had a problem, and in order to fix it, we we planted the seeds of the housing bubble that happened later on. So all of these things don't seem to me like they fit the definition of crisis. And I would like to hear from you, is there a threshold above which we can consider something in crisis, a crisis and legitimize some erosion of freedom or there's no such threshold and it's not even, there's no point to even define it? Somebody was coming. Um, well, of course, if you apply it to COVID or to 9-11 or to other crises where large numbers of people have died, uh, you can't really measure it. However, people don't compare, and a lot of people will now consider me either a cynic or a thing. We do not study the alternatives. How many people died or were severely injured mentally through the lockdowns? How many people will die because uh, their company went broke, or they were fired, or all of those. You can't compare that directly. Uh, so I'll use another example. Uh, when, I, when I was very young, some nutcase decided that they could poison bottles of Tylenol. You have Tylenol here? It's a, it's a pain reliever, like aspirin, basically. And in the United States, some guy wanted to uh, get money from, a, uh, from AA Tylenol, the company that made the product, and the supermarkets. And they took pills that looked very similar to Tylenol and put them in the Tylenol bottles. And a few people got sick from this poison that they put in there. How many of you know this story? Not very many. That story is the reason that now when you open a bottle of mouthwash or a bottle of medicine or 
a tube of toothpaste or any number of bowels, you need a knife, because I can never get these things open where it says tear. Uh, I, I need to use force, but you know, all those plastic wrappers around your mouthwash bottles, your toothpaste, your whatever, this is why all and anything that you consume now has to be sealed in such a way uh, that basically you can't get it at it anymore, worldwide. Because a couple of people died. Now, is that worth it? It's like the, it's like the sh it's very similar to the shoe example, you know. One guy put, uh, uh, put explosives in his shoe and then the rest of the world. We're not even talking about this. And I'm going to frame it in a totally different way to show you. We're talking about plastic straws at McDonald's? <laughs> Can you imagine how much plastic was used in the past 40 years since this ordinance came to seal all of these things? Can you imagine? McDonald's can't sell enough Cokes with plastic straws in them. No way. Too bad he was. So, you have to make some kind of comparison, even though that comparison sounds cynical at some point. You have to do the math every time you, you pass a new law. Um, in Austria, they passed a law, they raised the price of gasoline, uh, regular petrol. However, they didn't. It, for, for some reason. They didn't raise the tax on diesel because truckers, trucks use diesel, so they didn't want the transport industry to suffer. suffer. At that point in time, 95% of all regular automobiles in Austria were petrol-driven automobiles. Now, over 70% of them are diesel-powered automobiles which not only changed the thing, people voted with their feet or with their wallet and bought diesel cars. Then all of a sudden, it turns out that diesel is not that efficient. It blows all kinds of stuff uh, into the air that is bad for your lungs. So now you have to put filters in your diesel cars or you have to add uh, basically urine. So you have to piss in the tank of your diesel car in order to stop it from emitting stuff. They d it, it's called blue tech, if, you, if anybody, anybody wants to look it up. But basically, it's urine. Yeah, seriously. I don't, Google it. Um, and because I'm on the Americans today, they legalized marijuana in California. Which is, you know, a good thing. Uh, and then a whole industry grew from legal marijuana and its stock exchange quoted, and they're all going through the roof and so on and so forth. However, they regulated it in such a way that it became very difficult to grow and sell marijuana and marijuana products in California. So then COVID came, and a lot of these California marijuana growers got into trouble. So California passed a law to subsidize the California legal marijuana industry with $100 million. Now, I'm sorry, if you can't make money selling pot in California, you're doing something totally wrong. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, most of these crises are not crises, right? They're completely created by the government. Uh, almost all, the only crisis is war. The only crisis that a government should care about, that a government is engaged in, is, is a war. All the other crises are completely artificial. They're made up. They are, you know, COVID is a virus. Okay, that's what we have doctors and hospitals and insurance companies and uh, drug companies and so on to deal with the virus. The government should 
it has a role in isolating people who test positive. They're responsible for the protection of my rights. So if you test positive and you insist on, um, you know, coming over, yeah, the government has a job in stopping you. But that's it. The government has no job in COVID. They have no job with regard to gasoline versus diesel. Right? What if two people, uh, one of them has COVID, the other one doesn't care, decide to meet? Should the government stop them? Well, if they could meet where only the two are affected, no. And, and look, it, it's a question that has to be really thought out. I don't have the answer to it. it, it does COVID justify government intervention? Clearly Ebola does, if Ebola was contagious, right? And so what's the threshold? How many people have to die? How, how contagious does it need to be? There's a whole thinking that has to be done, you know, in terms of when is government, why, you know, government doesn't intervene in the flu and the cold, but it does intervene with, with COVID. Now, COVID's more deadly than the flu and the cold, so okay. But how much deadlier does it have to be before government intervenes? These are real questions. I don't have answers. Somebody has to think them through. It, the one job of kind of political philosophers or, or, or legislators should be to think about these things and come up with reasonable solutions. And, um, and maybe the cantons can compete about who has different uh, solutions to these kind of issues. These are issues that are not clear cut. Murder is bad. We all know that. You can't have a canton that says murder is okay here, right? That's not acceptable. But within like state rights in America, you could have some variation across states in terms of how they respond to a pandemic depending on how they define when they should intervene or not. But the intervention has to be focused. It has to be focused on preventing those who have the disease from, contain from, from giving to others. But if you don't have the disease, if you test negative, you're not a threat to anybody. And it's not your job to prove that you're not a threat. It's their job to prove that you are. You know, you're innocent until proven guilty according to our legal system. So all these crises are created. We've got a massive economic crisis. We don't feel it because the government has printed up huge amounts of money to cover it all up. But there's a massive economic crisis. I mean, you walk across Oxford Street, not the big stores. The big stores are fine. But if you walk a little bit on Oxford Street and you look at the little stores, how many of them are closed? How many of them shut it down? All open a year and a half ago when I was in London. Now they're gone. You, you walk through Soho, as nice as Soho is. How many stores are closed down in Soho? A lot. Now, there's also new stores opening up, so the entrepreneurial spirit is still alive and well. But there's real economic pain out there that's been hidden by all the government handouts. And now they want to punish the online sales instead. Yes, they want to punish the online sales, which saved us. It's the reason why we could sustain our, our economic well-being through COVID. Um, it, it, government has no business in any of this. It needs to just get out of the way. And again, the only way to do that is to have a principle, is to have a principle to guide when should government intervene, when shouldn't government intervene. And if your rights are not threatened, government has no role, government has no job. And other than crime and the threat of war and violating contracts and things like that, your rights, are, are not being threatened by, you know, viruses, yes, uh, potentially in extreme circumstances, but 99% of the time, as you're living around, your rights are not being threatened, so government has no business, right? Uh, uh, skyscrapers, whether you should build skyscrapers, I mean, maybe we shouldn't, I don't care. I mean, maybe, maybe we should all live in low homes. You decide. I, you know, I, so it's, it's, there has to be a governing principle on when government intervenes or not, Otherwise, we're lost. Thank you. Okay, now we will go to first a uh, super chat question, and then if we have time, we'll go to audience. So we have a question. Yeah. By the way, if uh, you want to be prioritized and you're in the audience, you can send a super chat uh, online. <laughs> so uh, we have a question from Mark Goodkin. Thank you, Mark, which I know nothing about this question, so I'll leave it to the speakers. Can the speakers comment on the great reset? I don't know what that is. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done, at, uh, what is it, three shows on The Great Reset, on, my, on the Iran Book Show, so if you're interested in The Great Reset, you can find it there. And The Great Reset is um, the idea coming out of the World Economic Forum, um, and it is an idea that uh, COVID is an opportunity to reset the global economy, 
It is uh, primarily driven by a, a leftist agenda, uh, although others have chimed in as well and jumped in on this bandwagon. And the idea is that, uh, you know, government has just shown that they have a huge amount of power. Um, most statists have learned from COVID that, look, government can do amazing things. They shut down a whole economy. And, you know, people don't starve in the streets. We can survive it. It's okay. Right? That's the danger of government's, quote, success, is that they live. Well, what other big projects can we engage in uh, as governments? And, and, and can we completely reset the world economy away from capitalism, explicitly away from capitalism? Or, or they like to say, we don't want to end capitalism. We want to reform capitalism, which is you know, a lot more socialism, right? That's, that's the way they want to reform capitalism. Um, in particular, the one big issue that they have learned uh, from COVID that, they, that the government can get involved in and the government can reset is climate change. So, um, you know, if government can shut you, it can keep you home because you might infect other people with the virus. Government can keep you home because you might uh, drive your car and pollute the air and, you know, emit CO2. Government might be able to force you to do a lot of things that you wouldn't otherwise do. So they uh, view this as an opportunity to uh, both uh, embrace many policies, uh, pro-climate, supposedly, that help the climate. Supposedly, I say, because they don't. Uh, that help the climate. I don't even know what helping the climate is. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm tired. Um, that, that, that help the cause of climate change. That don't help the climate. Climate doesn't need help. Um, and that, uh, that help their cause. It, it, policies that in normal times we would not accept. In normal times they thought we would rebel against. But since we didn't rebel against COVID, since we didn't rebel against all the restrictions of COVID, they're assuming now's the opportunity for them to step in and control our lives and regulate our lives in, in, a, in, a, in a much more substantial way. All you have to do is do, put in Google the Great Reset. It's not some conspiracy theory. It's uh, the, the chairman of the, of the um, World Economic Forum talks about this. Uh, he's, got a, he's got a perfect German accent to talk about it, <laughs> uh, about resetting the world economy, uh, you know, towards more statism and less capitalism and restricting our freedoms and saving the planet and all this stuff. It's really dangerous stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, corporations in the world, as Richard said, they jump on this because it's an opportunity for them to reset the regulations to some extent in their favor to, 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 to figure this out. So there's, there's actually quite a bit of support for this. It sounds good, right? We're fighting climate change. Uh, but the, the agenda is much broader than climate change. The agenda clearly is uh, a complete restructuring of, of, of uh, capitalism. For example, one of the top bullet points under the Great Reset is stakeholder, so-called stakeholder capitalism. That is eliminating the idea that shareholders matter, that the corporation should be run for the benefit of shareholders, which means the elimination of private property. So, I mean, philosophically, that's what it means. But, but it's a real change in the way business would be done in the West. And uh, it's getting it's getting a lot of support from a lot of powerful people. Just a small addition. Uh, yes, I think that uh, to what Yaren said, that uh, this whole discourse, this whole idea that you can uh, restart the economy, reset it, put it on pause, and then relaunch it again, uh, is in fact, it's very dangerous because this uh, reinforces this thinking about the economy as a machine, which uh, we can consciously guide. And economy is not a machine, it's a living organism. You cannot put uh, somebody's heart or lung on pause. And another point uh, about, again, the climate change and uh, other things that many people are concerned about. Uh, again, there are a lot of uh, solutions that are provided by the private sector, by the capitalist, but uh, people who are uh, fiercely campaigning uh, in this field, they say, no, it's, it's, it's just in principle it's wrong. It should be the big government, uh, ideally the global government. Uh, so any time there's a capitalist offering something, uh, they, it, it should be something wrong with it. It's it just, it's not right. And uh, speaking of cars uh, that Richard mentioned, you know that uh, cities, again, I'm back to my own topic, uh, big cities are becoming... Uh, 
cleaner, the air is becoming cleaner, not because of the restrictions uh, so of, uh, on uh, the, use of, uh, the use of cars or this uh, low emission zones. Uh, they're getting cleaner because people are getting richer and then kind of own new cars which are emitting less. And this is something that we don't see and uh, something that's not on the surface because there are seen and consequences and unseen consequences. And then the government steps in and claims that it's their... Uh, it's the result of their job that they imposed some more regulations, some more restrictions, uh, some more rules, uh, but there's just so many solutions that come from the private sector uh, which, which we don't see and which we should talk more about. Great. We have only four minutes until... Uh, sorry. I'm still going to answer that question. You would like to answer the Great Reset question? Yeah. Okay. Um, the one thing is, you, you don't know how to measure it, the Great Reset, and you can't hold government responsible. And the whole climate change thing uh, is a shell game where they move it, move it around. I'll just give one example. Uh, Germany raised taxes on gasoline again, one of my hobbies. Um, and that made gasoline in Germany more expensive than gasoline in Austria and Switzerland. So what happens? People that are close enough to the border, uh, they drive over the border and they get gas in Austria or Switzerland. Normal thing, right? Um, except when on a global basis we're counting CO2 emissions. Because those CO2 emissions caused by German drivers in German cars on German roads <laughs> are counted as Austrian because they bought their gas in Austria. And until we have full accountability of the government of what they do and how it's measured, things are not gonna change. You know, when, if they have a tidal wave in, in Japan and the German government has just decided you can run your atomic power plants another 25 years in Germany, and then they have a tidal wave in Japan, and then the German government says you have to shut them down in three years. That they're going to get a tidal wave in Germany, right? Yeah, because they're going to get a tidal wave in Germany. Um, that does not give planning security to anybody. If they pass a law, and we can discuss on what laws governments can pass or can't pass, but if they pass a law, it should kind of be continuous and make sense. Pass one law, and then I know as a company, as a private individual, I have to abide by a law. We are all trusted with this. We get a driver's license, or driving, what do you call it here? And government trusts us. You know to do this. When I come to this country, I am trusted to drive on a different side of a road than I am used to with the same license. The UK, the UK accepts that I have a, drive, a valid driving license and therefore I just have to look up what laws apply here in the UK and you know they happen to drive on a different side of the road, I'll do that. And if I go to Germany, I can go 120 miles an hour, and nobody will stop me. If I do that in West Virginia, they'll arrest me or shoot me or both. Uh, but one easy law, a driving license, different ways of treating it in every country, but we can still, we can still make it work somehow just by individuals looking at what you have to do or don't have to do. It's that simple. Thank you. Unfortunately, we won't have time for any audience questions, so I'm really sorry about that. Uh, because we'll do the, that at dinner, right? Yeah, the, the room is booked until 7, but you guys can go for dinner. If you are members <laughs> of the Ayn Rand Center UK, which you can become uh, by visiting aynrandcenter.co.uk slash memberships. You don't take cash? Uh, I think no, no cash. <laughs> Bitcoin? No Bitcoin. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would love to join you for the dinner, but I cannot because I have to go to my son. Uh, but thank you all very much. Thanks for coming. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks to the 
Einan Center UK and Razi for organizing it, and thanks also to the Austrian Economic Center for uh, co-organizing this event and our speakers and everyone that came. Thank you all for coming.